Back in 2018, I released a video about Twisted Metal. Not just any game of the franchise, but a cancelled sequel to Black called Harbor City. Many others covered this before I even touched it, but what they had in common is that no one really talked about this. Nah, they covered their urban legend, which made it famous. Or infamous. It seems like I'm the only one who covered it in length at the time, and this ended up being one of my most popular videos on my channel, Base 2.0 racking with over 100k views. Then two years later, I made a follow-up which shows gameplay of the late build for the first time. These videos will become the unofficial pilot episodes of what's going to be Lost Legends, and then Red Dead Revolver being the official one. Instead of me telling you to go watch them, I'm gonna do the whole thing again, with the history, the game, playable builds, and everything else. I hope you like hour-long videos, people, and welcome to a special episode of Lost Legends. Twisted Metal, the black sequel that never was. The complete history. The year is 1999, and the fourth entry of Twisted Metal was released. Twisted Metal 4 is a unique take where our favorite psychotic clown runs the show, and Calypso is a playable character. The game did have some improvements from Twisted 3, like better AI, gameplay, fun environments, and a novelty of making your own car, which is very limited. However, the reception was mixed, and the game was outweighed by the wackiness of it all. Some say it's worse than 3, but I think they're off their meds when saying that. Meanwhile, Single Track, the company behind Twisted Metals 1 and 2, are on their way out. Their Twisted Metal-like spin-offs, Rogue Trip and Critical Death sold fairly well, but their next entries like Streak and Outwars did not, commercially and critically. For the next installment, Sony bring back series creators Dave Jaffe and Scott Campbell to direct the next Twisted Metal game, along with a new company they run known as Incognito, until they were later forced to change it to Incog Inc. due to legal threats of a board game company who already claimed it. Then in 2005, they rebranded as Incognito Entertainment. We're just gonna stick with Incognito for now. Their next entry went on with a few ideas. One is dubbed Twisted Metal Road Trip, which is an Americana take where contestants fight across the US of A. Another is Twisted Metal Wasteland, a post apocalyptic Mad Max take on the series. Lastly, there was a more lighter tone entry known as Twisted Metal Small Brawl, which was released as its own game on the PS1. So, for their first entry on the then new PS2, they decided to make a game that's a stark contrast from the previous entries. One that stands out from the wacky, vibrant world, and into one that's a little more... Black. Almost two years later, Incognito released Twisted Metal Black in June 2001. Twisted Black is a far cry, but in a good way. This is the very first game in the franchise that garnered an M rating, and for good reason when we talk about its subject matter. This is also the first Twisted Metal game to have an online feature, but that's only exclusive to its own game disc known as Twisted Metal Black Online, where the fan servers are still active to this very day. This game's vibes makes the previous entry look like a children's cartoon in comparison. Gameplay is fast, smooth, and intense. Visuals are bleak, depressing, and atmospheric. The roster is loaded with some of the most twisted looking characters in the series. Starting with a psycho hillbilly Voldemort, a leather clad girl with a doll mask she can't remove, a cannibalistic Vietnam War veteran wearing his friend's skull as a helmet, a boxer who had his facial features surgically removed and sewn shut, and a fat bastard killer clown with a burning headache. Their character bios are treated like medical patients. Unlike the previous games where the characters only had a brief bio and single ending, Twisted Black's stories are more in-depth than the previous entries. They're in a three-act structure, the beginning where they meet Calypso in their holding cell and find out their motives, the middle remembering the moment where everything went wrong, 
in the end where they finally got their wish. Well, that's most of them. The unlockable characters only had their endings, like they do to budget and time constraints. I mean, for starters on budget, the voices of Axel and Agent Stone. See, God only has time for those who deserve his mercy. I just didn't qualify. Let me adjust the pitch a bit. I knew Calypso by reputation. You don't spend 10 years on the force without knowing every dirtbag in Midtown. Speaking of voices, Calypso doesn't even speak in this one, as the stories are narrated by the drivers. Unlike the previous entries where someone asked for a wish and get Monkey's Pod, Calypso already knew what they wanted, and gladly handed to them on a silver platter. Save for ones who work for the government, like Outlaw's running gag on having their wishes backfired. Originally, some of the backstories were meant to be much darker, but had to tone it down because... Um... This is the best Twisted Metal game critically. It received 8s and 9s across the board, unless you happen to live in the PAL regions where they removed the lore and the cutscenes. Shame. Good question, Mace. Why are you talking about Twisted Black first? The reason why I'm talking about Black first is because it needs context of what's going to be the sequel. Oh, you know, just to set the tone. A follow-up to Twisted Metal Black was in order from the INCOG team, but Dave Jaffe won't be involved at the start because he'll be working with Sony's Santa Monica studio on one of his ambitious projects, involving Greek mythology after he's done with Black in Connecticut. The date for when the whole pre-production phase began was hazy to say the least, but we know that early 2003 is when the game started production, reusing the same Connecticut engine that powered Twisted Black. Some problems showed up pretty early, starting with Sony handing the Incog Studio some dev kits for a new Sony handheld, later known as the PSP. They put the Black sequel on the back burner, in favor of making a new one for the PSP. This became Twisted Metal Head On. Not only that, the idea of bringing back Warhawk was on the tables. And the business, we call this foreshadowing. Apart from their shift in development, Incognito was true to their namesake. They kept quiet as there wasn't any announcements or hints from the press of what they're making was a sequel to Twisted Black. Only the developers and some concept artists know about it at the time. Speaking of which, I contacted one of them. In out of respect and wishes from the man I contacted, he wants to be remain anonymous. So I go for the pen name as... McLean. Come out to the coast, we'll get together, have a few laughs. So let me go on a small tangent and talk about corporate structures again. I already told you a bit of Capcom's divisions on Maximo, but the same can be applied to developers. Dibs don't usually have one massive team to work on a single big game, and Incog had two different teams to work on different smaller games. Team 1 is Downhill Domination, and Team 2 is War of the Monsters. One of them worked on Small Brawl, the other worked on Black. The art department which McLean worked in kind of floats between the two. If the one team is almost done developing their current project, then only a few people started working on a new one. If they finish that game, they split off to either deal with a new project or help the other team finish up theirs. And when that's done, they could go back and work on the new project. If they wanted to, of course. Yeah, the downhill team worked on head-on, while the other team, after finishing on monsters, began with Warhawk. The Twisted Metal Black 2 team consists in small numbers. Then, during 2005, they were handed some dev kits for the PS3, so development for Warhawk shifted to the then-new, unannounced console. Now, with zero news related to Black's sequel, 
Development on that game had to be quietly shut down in favor of getting Warhawk finished and released in August 2007 for PS3, which is Incog's final game. Later in 2008, Sony was porting PSP games for the aging PS2 console, and Head On was one of them, with Jaffe's involvement. Twisted Metal Head On Extra Twisted Edition included some bonus content, like a half hour documentary of the series, some concept arts, unreleased FMVs for Twist Metal 1, and a playable demo of the canned sequel no one knew until it's released. This is where we talk about the game. This new edition of Twisted Black goes under a few names, like Twisted Metal Black 2, Twisted Metal Black Part 2, but in canon, it's known as Twisted Metal Harbor City. This game was planned to change the whole TM formula with something different. For one, the arenas are connected together as one huge city via tunnels, freeways, off-beaten paths, etc., making the whole tournament seamless. Another thing is apart from the standard Twist Metal campaign, there's also a separate mode where you play as either Sweet Tooth or the Preacher to do missions. But sometimes, the missions are on foot. Most of the contenders from Black have returned, with some returning cars like Thumper and Twister. Some new contenders would include a stock car and an old pickup truck. The battlegrounds would consist of the ghetto, downtown districts, industrial areas, an amusement park, and even a shopping mall to wreak havoc inside. Gameplay would have been an updated version of Black's, with some things adjusted like the handling models and balancing. Nothing special really. One thing that's not confirmed whether or not the drivers from Black will return. Of course Needles, Kane, and the Preacher are official, but what about the ones like Billy Ray, No Face, Raven, and Bloody Mary? We may never know, since the drivers and stories are one of the last parts of developing a Twisted Metal game, according to the devs from the Dark Past documentary. Oh, and before you ask me about the cancellation, it's time for me to talk about that bit. For years, the one reason why Harbor City got the axe is according to Head On, it got cancelled due to six of the key staff members from Incog died in a plane crash during a Colorado skiing trip back in April 2005. Then two years later, a letter was sent to Sony's offices written by the supposed dead developers, begging for them to release it. That's how it's advertised. People made videos about this specific topic, and I think there's some who still believed it, either from other YouTubers, internet forums, or even gaming magazines such as GamePro. To me, it's pure nonsense. And so, I did some digging. Well, the past me did some digging. Finding 80 news articles and records of plane crashes around that specific date. End result doesn't match both the victims and locations in Colorado. Then again, I couldn't identify the names in this handwriting since the video quality is in a low resolution, even through emulation. I even cross-referenced the credits from three Incog games, ones that I own at least, and no luck on who are the six developers. Until one confirmed name who worked on it, Chad Little. In his Tumblr blog from February 16, 2013, he confirmed that he worked on the game, and stated that the whole plane crash thing is indeed a hoax, just like that evil farming game where Reddit went on a wild goose chase for years. So this leads to the big question, what is the real reason why it got cancelled? Glad you ask. There are a few factors why, like key developers like Scott Campbell not being too involved for one. Another reason came from both sources, a Twisted Metal Alliance member named Kirahi who contacted the former staff members, and I contacted Dave Jaffe himself despite not being involved. Both sources claim that the game needed to be more viable, so they tried to make Harbor City to fall in more like GTA. The devs plan after finishing Head On is that they were going to continue Harbor City, but rumor states that Scott Campbell and the higher ups at Incog were sick of Twisted Metal after Head On, despite Twisted Metal Black sold more than a few million copies. Their other titles didn't perform well to keep the company afloat, and Warhawk at the time is a bloated mess that's too expensive to cancel. 
On Jaffe's side, him and Campbell were also working on a PSP game known as Heartland, which is an FPS taking place in a revisionist America with political themes. The game didn't get off the ground, assuming the lack of resources and most of the incog devs moved on to help develop Warhawk. After God of War and its sequel came out and sold gangbusters, Dave spent his earnings on forming a new company with Campbell known as Eat Sleep Play. That company had former Incog members who developed some games on the PS2 and PS3. When Sony looked at the games Incog had and not made considerable progress, they just outright killed off the projects, and essentially Incognito Entertainment as a whole. That's probably the main reason. One other reason I read on Liddell's blog. It was cancelled a week after it went to Alpha, because Sony execs didn't have any faith when GTA is printing money, and this would flop in store shelves. That then allegedly the on-foot mechanic was slapped on there because Sony execs told them to, just to be a little more like Grand Theft Auto. If this sounds a little too confusing, here's the scapegoat version. The game got cancelled because of Warhawk, and then most of the staff moved to Eat Sleep Play. Now consider this, Harbor City may have set sail from 2003, but the ship has sunk long before it made it to shores, and what was left is nothing more than a bonus feature from a ported PSP game. Allegedly, Harbor City was roughly around 70% complete before it got the can. Then again, there's more than just a glorified bonus feature when I get to talk about them Harbor City builds. Among the vast sea of lost media, Twisted Metal is no stranger to have their beta builds dumped. Maybe one day that early Twisted Metal 3 prototype will be dumped, because who wouldn't go postal while driving a USPS van? For Harbor City, we have several builds of this game that have been surfaced online, thanks to the Cult of Osiris. There's three builds dumped to the public, along with a couple early versions of Head On running on the PS2 as a bonus. Before we get to the main protos, we must cover the one that's officially available, Twisted Metal Lost. This is a stripped down version of what's going to be the main game in question. You get to play as the entire cast of Twisted Metal Black, except Minion, plus two new vehicles, Gold Tooth, a powerful gold variant of Sweet Tooth, and 12 Pack, a stock car driven by Severed Sam. You also fight in three arenas, the Suburban, the Stadium, and the Carnival. Sadly, those arenas aren't connected to demonstrate the seamless transitions. Beating the very brief campaign also unlocks a bonus cutscene, the new vehicles, and an extra arena where you fight on top of aircraft carriers. There is one more, but we'll get to that later in the video. Gameplay is the same as Head On, and that includes the HUD, the sound where your health is low, motor sounds when selecting vehicles, and how dumb the AI is at times. The soundtrack is just a sped up version of Black, and that's all there is in the car combat portion. The one difference between Head On is the energy attacks can be used with a simple two button combination by pressing triangle in the D-pad, which is so convenient, the PS3 game only used a D-pad for such attacks. The Sweet Tour mode demonstrates the on foot portions as Needles Kane, while navigating through an asylum and an impound lot. Interacting with these Sweet Tooth heads gives you some interesting Twisted Metal facts, which are 29 to collect. It bugs me not to include a 30th fact. Gameplay is awfully rough. You could punch, perform a combo, and jib Sony's big executives in one hit. It's impossible to die in this game mode as enemies and hazards are non-existent. This is just an interesting time capsule of what could have been. Now, it's time to take a look at the real deal, the prototypes. This build is quite fussy to get it running, well, to the gameplay. First off, you head to Dev Shell, because the game crashes if you do it on the main menu. Select split screen, and the game does start, but go kill your opponent. Then you can interact with Dev Shell again, and choose something like Endurance, pick a car, arena, and the game starts on a full screen. As you can see, this build isn't very stable, so use safe states. 
You have a selection of cards from Twist Black, but also ones that's going to be in Head On, like Twister, Hammerhead, and Mr. Slam. Grasshopper and a new version of Warthog are also planned, but their models are just a green placeholder. You may notice that the car models looked off from their black counterpart. Guess what? Turns out I was right, and the game used the AI models, which are low quality versions of the player ones. The selection of arenas are only a few. The Ghetto, Goth, Rail Yard, S Center, and the Docks. There's also an airport, but that one's inaccessible because it doesn't exist in the game files. The arenas are clearly far from finished, mostly covered with placeholder textures, objects that had no hit detection, and it's easy to get off the map. The soundtrack is also temporary, consisting of Kid Rock, KMFDM, Massive Attack, and the Dust Brothers from the Fight Club soundtrack, albeit in short loops. The only two arenas that have work put into them are Goth, the Mall, and Docks, as they're mostly textured and had pets and cars littered all over. You can't quit the game, but you have access to an extensive debug menu which lets you tinker quite a lot. Personally, I go for FOV, move the HUD due to said FOV, and the option to reset the car position. Unfortunately, the opponents are non-functional, sometimes located out of bounds. Luckily for me, this means that you could explore these areas in peace. The docks is the only map to have a different skybox, and the rest of them use this cloudy weather for the rest of this build. This arena has some ships to drive onto, a parking garage, and a double decker freeway. This is also the only level where it showcases the out of bounds only hurts you instead of being instant death. The ghetto looks like a boring map, though the placeholder textures doesn't help but there are some notable landmarks I could make out. For instance, there's a gymnasium, a couple gas stations, a baseball field, soccer field, the power plant, and a motel. Goth, or Blackfield Mall according to the sign, is a massive shopping mall built inside of a mega church. It doesn't have much destructible objects laying around, but it does have a lot of space that extends outside to the parking lot. Goth also had an alleyway you can access, which leads to S Center, supposedly. Oh, by the way, nice billboard. Rail Yard takes place in what could be the outskirts of town, with some train cars to crash through, some construction site, and across the bridges is some industrial area. There is also another freeway which I can't access. Lastly, S Center is loosely modeled after the Seattle Center, hence the name complete with monorail, indoor basketball stadium, outdoor football field, a small carnival, Pacific Science Center, and even the Space Needle itself. And yes, you can destroy that damn thing. So, this build is prone to crashing and the vehicles themselves are one of the main causes. The playable vehicles were Roadkill, Hammerhead, Brimstone, Grasshopper, Warthog, Head-On's Mr. Grimm, Twister, Mr. Slam, Head-On's Outlaw, and Yellow Jacket. You can't play as Manslaughter, Darkseid, Black's Outlaw, or Warthog, Thumper, Junkyard Dog, Crazy Eight, Axel, Shadow, Crimson Fury, and even Sweet Tooth. These would send you back to the BIOS. The video by Dark Scorpius had footage of this many years before this was dumped. This build looks like it was made shortly after the January version as all the cards are playable. It had an online mode plan, which could have been functional. Then again, probably not. The next spell may look exactly the same in hindsight, but this one here does have a few changes. Just minor updates. Mainly the levels now have pickups on it, working AI, and you can quit the game. Sometimes. And most of the cars are playable in this version, but only a couple aren't. However, you still have to start the game with Dev Shell, but you don't need to start split screen first thing. Then again, use safe states. The gameplay remains the same, but oddities occur when your opponents are using their head on models, which clashes with the prototype's art style. KMFDM's terror had this at the end of the loop.
the game has a different pause screen, with options like a map screen, hints, weapon info, and even upgrades. All of which are unusual for this game. But do you know what this is? I think they're also testing out Warhawk, back when it was a PS2 game. The levels are slightly updated, so let's give a quick rundown. In Goth, all the shop signage are replaced with temporary ones. It has furniture in one end of the mall, it has traffic, and if you take the alley, the game will lag at the end of it. The docks also has traffic, but it has a lot more checkerboard buildings. One place where the floating containers used to be are replaced by some more checkerboard boxes, and there's some purple colored scenery. The ghetto have very different road textures, and had a radio tower next to the freeway. Rail yards seem to have very little changes, and S Center spawns me right under the map, likely using the wrong files associated to said map, as I can see objects that are out of reach or under the geometry. The unused airport level is now blank in the level select. Now with those out of the way, for now, let's talk about the latest and most interesting build. The August 2005 Prototype, also known as the Late Build. So I was going to say that you can't play this emulated because this was made specifically for an expensive PS2 dev kit known as the Tool. This was true back in 2021, and three years later, the ancient code wizards from the Twisted Metal community finally made it playable on PCSX2. This means I had to rewrite this portion so I can play myself. This also means I have to cut the Harbor City mod portion since that's redundant now. The game plays indeed the usual Twisted Metal Black gameplay, but this time the three skill weapons, you know, the reticle, the zoomies, and the sat missiles, are replaced with one singular zoomy missile, which is just swarm missiles from head on. Also from head on was the damage system, indicating the damage dealt when attacking enemies this time more apparent. The temporary music was cut out, except the main menu which is just ambience. Then again, the game had some sound bugs which makes it mute or doesn't play at all. You play as most of Twist Metal Black's characters, but also Thumper, 12 Pack in Blue, an old pickup I dubbed Fat Slim, and the return of Pit Viper, who never made an appearance since Twisted 1. There are some omissions from the previous builds, such as 10 cars from Black and Head Auto are missing, and the new cars use Spectre's Ghost Missiles. The battlegrounds for Harbor City are mostly finished. And this ranges from the ghetto, downtown, carnival, mall, rail yard, suburbs, stadium, docks, shipyard, and an airport. There's only a few maps that don't work or don't exist when this build was made. Story mode is your standard twist metal game mode, but this time after defeating all your enemies, there's an opening where you get in a transitional area and jump into the next part of town. However, only the ghetto, downtown, city center, and the mall are the only connected areas to play in this mode. So if you manage to win the battle in the mall, that's it, you're stuck. It's kinda odd that the transition area they use is the sewer tunnels instead of the alleys shown in the older build. As of the other maps, they don't have a transitional area. Okay, they do have them and had places that leads to a transition, but these don't load. Okay, that's a bit of a white lie, so if you select Start Host Game, then the game loads with the previously played level. Going to the Show DD page in the Tweak menu and enabling it shows the internal names of the level and transition area. So, Railyard had Trans 1 and DTSC, which the latter is the transition between downtown and city center. Trans 1 on the other hand does nothing. Don't know where it is and it's detected when I got into the freeway. The other level that has a transition is the suburbs, 
and oddly it has a sewer section slap dash in the middle of the level. That leads to city center. There's also an online mode built in the game. Oddly this one reused head-on's front end if you're not connected to the internet. Now all that's out of the way. We need to talk about the game's main feature. The mission mode only lets you play as Sweet Tooth, and there's no playable preacher. There's only 7 missions where you escape the asylum, hijack an ambulance, head to an impound lot, retrieve your truck, fight the cops, fight some goons, chase the mole who got you back to the asylum in the first place, and finally find the mole in the mall. The on foot missions are there, and true to Twist Metal Lost Sweet Tour mode. These are far from finished. However, there are indeed some new things to try out, like Sweet Tooth engaging combat on some primitive enemies, static doggos, use objects, and even a shotgun. It's quite funny that a fat bastard like Sweet Tooth can hold a V8 engine on his single hand, and at the same time, climb a ladder with it. Even more comedic is that he could yeet that hunk of metal like he was trained by King Kai. There's also a block button and yes, you can die while on foot. And there's a button to resurrect. Oddly, L1 is the jump button, not X. The Asylum Escape sequence starts with a button mashing minigame so you can escape the cage. Then the action begins just like Sweet Tour, but the difference is instead of Sweet Tooth heads, there's enemies, weapons, and objects sprinkled all over the place. During this level, you have to find an ID card so you can access the second half of this place, which to Sweet Tour mode omits. There's a bug where you can't interrogate Shue Yoshida in the control room where you're supposed to get the ID card from, but I have other ways to get there by jumping really high. The second half looks like some demented hospital hallway with some bloody furniture and walls, toilets that haven't been flushed, security guards that are too scared to fight, a surgery room with a bloody operating table, and the end leads to a garage with an ambulance where needles hijack. Do you know how these levels end? They don't. No elaborate cutscenes, no end of level screen, nada. Part 2 of the escape is where you drive a unique car, the ambulance. This cannot shoot, but it can jump. Maybe use a shield, but didn't bother to try. So it has no HUD, you're being chased by coppers, barricades, and some early FMVs that show certain set pieces being changed, forcing you to change routes. Once you're down to some small patch of civilization, there's a big whack off green arrow showing you where to find the impound lot, so you can reclaim your ice cream truck. This would have been a surefire way to end this level, and it does have placeholder text for cutscenes. After that's done, you're back in the game in a slightly different location from where you stopped. The impound lot is a little different than what's shown in Sweet Tour. I mean, apart from enemies and weapons littered all over, there's some minor changes to the design. Like there's some furniture in some rooms, you have to shimmy on top of some scaffolding, and you have an objective to reclaim your car keys before you get to the truck. Yeah, that's it. The next two missions are your standard twist metal matches in downtown against some cops and city center against some foes. The next one is one of those chase missions where you have to track down Calypso's mole, presented by Brimstone, alive. However, the chase stops at the basketball stadium. The final one is another on foot section but takes place in the mall. However, this one looks like it's barely started. The location only has a unique spot, with a great chunk of the mall itself being used. It starts with a food court, then the balcony, some empty rooms, lots of ladders to climb, and the end leads to nowhere. Game has ideas that it was going to be loaded with content. However, considering the following missions, the lack of boss battles in a short campaign, keep this in mind that this is an alpha build after all. None of the entire thing represents or what's supposed to be the final product. Despite the lack of marketing, what we do have is a surprising amount of images around the internet. Let's look at the chunk of imagery that isn't shown in these builds. It turns out according to the dates, these are from builds dated between January 2004 to August 2005. 
So, in a 19 month time span, a lot has changed. Let's look at them. Let's begin with the ghetto and see how far it had become. These screenshots look like the old version of the ghetto, but fully textured. There's this restaurant called Jesus Saves, with a suspicious billboard asking for a young boy- <coughs> Someone's going to hell for that. During development, the sign doesn't exist, and it was changed to a more tame bowling alley. The house is shown in the prototype was later replaced by apartment buildings. The industrial plants, on the other hand, are one huge factory, apart from, you know, being split into a few sectors. One of which is the nuclear power plant that was waiting for a fallout. <laughs> Lastly, the cemetery was going to have this haunted house or church, but it was replaced by a big angel statue surrounded by mausoleums. The mall only faced minor graphical changes. Most of them are store signs that needed to be less explicit. That and the skybox is now green. The rail yard had to cut down in size, which means the construction area is gone in the later build. Not a lot of changes, except this freeway now has a tunnel not seen in the late build. Docks was meant to be much bigger than what was shown. A 50-50 in city and pier with cargo ships. There's also another tunnel that leads to somewhere. Here's another screenshot of the docks mid-development, and note that massive flat wall on the left. The city center, apart from the ghetto, had the most drastic changes mid-development. First it was loosely modeled after the Seattle center, hence S center, then half of the map is an amusement park. To begin, this monorail station now is fully textured, along with the amusement rides. Then the memorial football field that will get the chop, along with the parking garage, Mopop Center, Northern Neighborhood, the sewer entrance, arcade, and International Fountain. In the remodel, they kept the Space Needle and Pacific Science Center. Also, there's some roughly textured models. The Skull Island ride lacked lighting and early in development had rougher textures. The clown slide actually used a piece of concept art as its texture. Stadium had minimal changes, but this screenshot here lacked the banner, visible dirt tracks, and the coloring on the stands is more blue and green. Mini DT started off with a bare bones layout, along with some floating neon signs, some debug stats in a different font, and a very bare bones impound lot. As development went on, the scale for this part had to dial back a bit, and one of the things removed is this monorail thing. That then changed the dinky impound lot to make it much bigger. The airport had some changes during development. Notably, all the planes themselves use a placeholder texture. In the late build, most of them have textures, while some of them aren't. The destroyed ones are partially textured. Also, the early stages doesn't have any background scenery. The suburbs look like it takes place sometime early in the morning, as the whole level is brighter. In these screenshots contain some cut buildings, like a Carl's Jr. parody, a different model of the church, but I think that's the mini DT one, this nondescript building, these minor buildings, an electric power plant, and the Happy Town store, which is replaced by a pizza parlor. The donut shop had a different sign, and the donut has sprinkles on it. And there's another cut building that's possibly an early biker bar. I think. Lastly, the early pathways to the freeway. Note the weird hole on the cliffside, suggesting there was a tunnel here. The late build doesn't have that, but Twisted Laws brought it back as background scenery. Lastly, for car combat arenas. Downtown was meant to be much bigger. In the late build, the farmer's market, Chinatown, a movie theater, art museum, aquarium, and more space across the ravine are gone. There's also a train that roams on the tracks too. There's also this transition with a boatload of trees sprinkled on the side. Finally, there's the on-foot best that we never see in our late build exploration. First off, the church showing Sweet Tooth without the flames and holding an untextured 12-gauge. 
There's another shot of him in the church, along with his clone hiding in the back. This is possible that you have to fight the preacher, or play as him. Then we have two different bars. One with pool tables, and the other with the banner of a bike and untextured furniture. Next is an asylum corridor with the back shot of Sweet Tooth, and another one where he shoots his untextured gun. This set of screenshots is a convenience store, likely an AMPM parody. Then we have a strip club, complete with cardboard cutout of a stripper. There is a possible theory that this place will be in the mall. Gothwood had one storefront that's weirdly textured, and it has a corridor that would lead to said strip club, but we don't have it in this build. The last set of screenshots we have plenty, coming from an on-foot level. This nightclub with a stage, a bar, and some lounges. We don't have a clue what's the story significance of this, but here we are. There's also a couple clips that surface on the internet from time to time. This is an unreleased teaser trailer that was used in the documentary. Possibly this is what the game's cutscenes would have looked like. If you read the legal text here, it mentions Miranda, who is the driver of Twister and Head On. Possibly she is one of the confirmed Twisted Metal Harbor City characters. Another is the logo which is different from the others shown in the builds. As the title states, this is just some test animation where Sweet Tooth takes an infinite amount of masks off his face. Without context, we have no clue what this is about. However, I think this is just an animatic of what's going to be the Sweet Tooth ending. I think. I noticed that Becker's Island is named after Alan Becker, Sony Santa Monica's head honcho at the time. This next segment is going to be featured in Lost Legends Season 2, and it's going to be as its own subchapter for the cut content. However, we're only going to cover a concept art that's either a cut piece of content, or a design that's far different from the retail release. So for example, Acclaim's edgy platformer Vex had concept arts, more so on his main protagonist who went through more redesigns than my OC Vivi. At one point in the design, he has elf ears, wearing goggles, and had a weasel looking sidekick until they realized that, oh yeah. They're accidentally making a low-rent Jack and Daxter, so they scrapped that in place of a furry wearing war talons. Anyways, for now I gather whatever concept art I can for this video. This is a small set by concept artist Donald Yotomi. The first pieces here are early concepts for the ghetto, just to set the tone. The first one takes place in midday. And we have Twister in the middle of gunning down Yellow Jacket while being pelted with missiles from manslaughter. 
that another piece of ghetto art in a higher quality shows the place being more of a wreck, with this silo resting on top of this building, and Mr. Grimm shaking his fist at Axel in the distance. Also some homeless dudes are chilling. Another and better quality shows an overhead shot of the town, with cops and helicopters. There's a rough draft of the stadium level which looks abandoned. Then the rail yard. One is an overhead view of the mayhem in the train tracks, and another which how he envisioned the level if it's complete. Next, the carnival, which looks like absolute mayhem. In the beta version, the amusement park section is quite sparse, so this piece of concept art here kind of resembles a town fair, reminiscent of the one seen in the early build of Harbor City, but a lot more dense. Last is the mall which the first piece is well reflected from the beta, apart from one of the cars coming from the top rope, blasting Axel. What if I told you, there's a variant that's less gothic? Show him. For cars, this piece of roadkill resembling more of a 71 Dodge Charger. It's likely painted over from the 3D model, but who knows. Lastly, 12 pack in its color variations. In the beta, it's white and blue. In Lost, it's white and red. And the unused one is orange and white. The next set of concept art comes from Robert Padua, who is also the bloke who animated the only clips from Harbor City. For characters, we have this piece of Bloody Mary, who isn't happy with her would-be spouse giving her the wrong kind of necklace. So he got the literal axe. That door, she is still psychotic over the idea of marriage without the concept of love. Another piece is Needles Kane vs. The Preacher, and Preacher's losing. This could be some subplot related to Needles who is about to open up a can of whoop ass on the man who gave him the birdie scalp, but that's just me grasping at straws. There's another, but Needles got crucified. Next is Mr. Grimm who resembles more of the Grim Reaper, or resembling the head-on design. Lastly is this individual with a disfigured face and a sci-fi looking coupe. According to Padua, this is supposed to be none other than Calypso himself. Speaking of head-on designs, we have head-on Sweet Tooth parking in front of a secluded home. Where's the context? I don't know. Even with less context, it's the cemetery. Lastly is the art of Twisted Metal, which consists of concept arts from the game's history, pre-2012. And yes, there's some Harbor City art in the mix. This was included in the head-on extra Twisted edition as a bonus, but I don't have it when I bought it used. So to begin with this page, we have Sweet Tooth giving the El Chapo on the poor unseen sod. And the next page is the Suburbs concept art, but it's too dark. The next page we saw some concept art from earlier, but the ghetto in green shows the collapsed bridge, shown in the late build. Flipping over, we have a very high contrast church, and to the right are concept arts for 12-pack, Twister, and Pit Viper. Lastly, we have an old logo of Harbor City. Now I don't know the origins of this. It could be fan made that happened to appear in Unseen 64's old ass page and all that. So let's have a comparison of the early logo, the late builds logo, this one, and the unused trailer. We have one last piece of concept art media, but I'm gonna hold on to that when we get to the next chapter, which is the cut content. Now, for some cut content for a game that didn't make the cuts. But well, let's head back to Twisted Metal Lost and talk about the cut 5th level, known as City of the Dead. It's a cut down ghetto area, consists of a graveyard, a ravine, elements from the downtown area, and an open highway tunnel that leads to nowhere. This level also contained the cut machine gun upgrade that the other levels didn't have, and it placed some 9 inch nails. Sadly, the big nuclear power plant was removed. The reason why it didn't make a cup is likely time constraints since the whole thing is almost finished. Now for ones in the prototypes however, I couldn't say much. Airport in the early proto for one I already mentioned it has no file associated to it. 
In the late build, there's more. There are four levels found in the late prototype. Freeway, Estate, Harbor 1, and Harbor 2. Harbor 1 and Harbor 2 stated that these are duplicates of the Asylum. The freeway can be accessed by hacking the level to the rebuilt 63 version of Harbor City. A YouTuber named Man Ages did got it working by inserting the files in the unused airport folder, and it's just an 8 minute long winding road. This was the original transition area that connects most, if not all, the Harbor City levels together. Estate had nothing in its folder, but what is it and where does it connect exactly? Well, we have answers. These three images here are dated from early to mid-2004, and they are the layout plans for Harbor City and where the levels connect. The whole map is massive, and the levels match the names for the late build's levels. So Ghetto and Downtown are connected. Docks is linked to Downtown and the Rail Yard. Suburbs connects to S Center, Rail Yard, and the Freeway. The mall links to S Center, like in the late build. And reaching all the way around, the shipyards connects to the stadium, and the airport connects between ghetto and stadium. Cool, so where's the state? According to the earliest layout, it connects to the shipyards and it goes by the name Becker's Estate. Assuming that this was connected to some military base, this is probably the final level for the mission mode, which leads to the Becker's Island animatic. That's probably the best possible answer. While you're gazing through this map, you may notice that Mini DT isn't in here. But that's because that place was added late in development, in lieu of the game's mission mode, which connects to the downtown district. For the game's transition areas, only four are used. DTSC, downtown the city center, Trans 1, city center the mall, Trans 6, ghetto to downtown, and Trans ASY the Asylum Transition. The rest are unused, which is a shame because these has some very data on it. But, what I can do is mess with the game files by swapping their names. I have a backup, don't worry. Also, I will use the layout map as a reference to tell you which one links which levels. Trans 2 is a sewer tunnel that originally links S Center and Suburbs. Trans 3 is a tunnel with some weird texture sprinkled in. This is meant to link the suburbs and rail yard. Trans 4 is another tunnel but with graffiti and some pillars. This is meant to link the rail yard and docks. Trans 5 cannot be loaded. Trans 7 is a cleaner tunnel, possibly links to the ghetto and airport. Trans 8 is an underground tunnel, linked to airport and stadium. Trans 9 is yet another tunnel, likely linked stadium and shipyard. This had some wonky road textures. Trans 10 is a basic winding road, linking downtown and docks. Trans 11 can be found if loaded in the suburbs. It's an S-curve, possibly an early link to the suburbs and the freeway. Trans 12 are two underground tunnels with green lighting. Someone told me that these are the tunnels used for the old downtown district. Trans 13 doesn't exist, Trans 14 cannot be loaded, Trans 15 doesn't exist, 
Trend 16 links Mini Downtown in Downtown, and it actually works. Trans 5 and 14 are possibly related due to its file size being a mere 2 kilobytes apart. It's unknown whether or not they could be connected to the freeway in some capacity. The ones that don't exist could possibly be linked to the estate level. Lastly, Subbar 1 is an odd one as it's a bar with a red box. A roughly textured bar with a red box. As the subname suggests, this is meant to be in the suburbs, and it's supposed to appear right where that square-shaped hole is located. Turns out it works, as if you drive into the red box, it switches to Sweet Tooth who automatically runs to the front door, while the whole map disappears. There's nothing inside of it, but it could possibly be related to one of the bar interiors, which was removed in game files. So you ever wonder why the roads in these levels had some weird dead ends? Well, I don't have a clue except the fact the game is unfinished. Again, these levels shown are reworked from between this one and the previous January build. Maybe at one point in development, all of these levels are connected to each other. When they decided to reduce the sheer size of these levels for the sake of hardware limitations, that was it, and only five levels have working transition areas. In terms of unused cars from the older builds, Crimson Fury is mentioned but no files besides their sound effects are associated. In the January 2004 build, only Manslaughter, Darkseid, Warhawk from Black, Crimson Fury, and Axel aren't playable. Sweet Tooth, Yellow Jacket, Thumper, Junkyard Dog, Hammerhead, Placeholder Grasshopper, Placeholder Warhog, Twist Metal Black's Mr. Grimm, and Brimstone lack their special weapons. In the late build, Crazy 8, Placeholder Grasshopper, Hammerhead, Shadow, Manslaughter, Twist Metal Black's Outlaw, Twist Metal Black's Warhog, Yellow Jacket, Junkyard Dog, Twister, and Placeholder Warhog aren't selectable in the main menu. There's also four TBD entries, but that will crash the game if you select it. These TBD names are likely meant for the boss vehicles or new adaptations of other Twist Metal cars that we don't know about, but that's just a guess. The mission mode stuff is pretty bare bones. There is only a few missions implemented, all of them are unfinished. The mission story mode didn't go very far since it stops after the seventh one. It's unknown what the plot of the whole game is supposed to be, and what roles Sweet Tooth, Preacher, and Doc Becker was in. But, but, according to McLean, there might be more than just them. Also, I did ask him about the Preacher and told me that yeah, the Preacher is indeed modeled and rigged, but the late build never got him in. Not to mention, he wasn't even in the latest build Jaffe had to make Twisted Lost from. When it comes down to weapons and items, there's some named objects in page 56 of the debug menu, the pickup tool. You could spawn items, not only for car combat but for on foot too. The first set of items are your standard weapons and 30% health, but the next two items are unused, and then we have a full health pickup, which isn't shown in the car combat portions, but for the on foot segment. I assume that since the on foot levels lacked any health pickups in the game, this will be the one. That door head on left over. However, car combat items cannot be picked up by the player. Then for proper on foot items, there's some sized objects that doesn't spawn normally in most levels, except the impound, which are the drums, tires, and engines. There's only two weapons that can't be used, and it's the pistol and knife. If spawned, these lack the model. For giggles, I replaced one of the car combat weapons with an axe. And surprisingly, it works. But it does nothing. Except for the text message on top of the screen. Now for sounds. Oh boy. I got this app that could play these sounds, like Doc Vadge and Doc Bank files. And I'm not gonna go through everything since a lot of them are just literally split second sound bites. The soundtrack are mostly short loops of licensed tracks, 
and the ones in the late build had a few leftovers from the previous ones, including Kid Rock being played in Dark Badge. The VPK ones also contain some unused tunes, like Nine Inch Nails, The Beastie Boys, and Rage Against the Machine. For slightly more original music, we have this one for testing. and a more catchy tune known as Shell. For the miscellaneous, there are leftovers from Twist Metal Head On in Black. The models are temporary, but so does the VBKs referring to the levels from Head On, their boss fights, etc. There is one more, which is the Proto Sweet Tooth model. However, swapping that just gives me a model of needles, but the rigging is buggered. I'm guessing this one is kinda used? as this bit of needle shown doesn't have his burning scalp. And so, that's all for the cut contents. So what's next? On the final segment, I have a theory. Who was going to drive the other vehicles from Black? Now Sweet Tooth and Preacher are confirmed. Mr. Grimm and Axel might have returned in this one, but what about the other drivers of Roadkill, Darkseid, or Spectre? Are they going to have new drivers? Maybe Dollface could see a return, but who knows. The remaining cars I don't have a clue, but I could take a shot in the dark on what kind of driver they could be. Outlaw, the police car, could be a crooked cop. Mr. Slam could be some disgruntled mechanic inspired by Marvin Heemeyer and Killdozer. Thumper could be some gangster archetype. Old Pickup could be a psychotic hillbilly like Billy Ray and Cousin Eddie. Twelve Pack will remain that severed Sam. And Pit Viper could be a rogue agent. Grasshopper and Warthog could likely be new vehicles for Harbor City, but there's a better chance that these two will be fully cut if development went on, since there's no concept art associated. Now I bet you're complaining that there is a full list of drivers for Harbor City, and it's in Twisted Lost. So for the drivers for Twisted Lost remain the same, with some... questionable motives. Here's some on screen. The problem with the models shown is that these are just slapdashed and littered with inconsistencies from their established characters. I mean, some of the characters do make sense, like Raven now being a vigilante, there's another John Doe taking the old one's place, and Bloody Mary just lost her sanity. The other characters are kinda ridiculous. Like Agent Stone now stuck in a time loop, No Face's quest to reconstruct his face to see his unmentioned daughter, Cage drives his Warhog without any limbs, and Black himself is rumored to be from a different dimension, destined to stop Black's Calypso. Again, most of the characters don't have a clear motive or wish, except a few. Twisted Loss is made from an unfinished build of Harbor City, with its levels stripped down to be bite-sized portions, music being sped up versions of Black's OST, and gameplay remains the same as Head On. What I'm saying here is that these biles are non-canon. Jaffe just made these on the spot. And thus, that leads up to today. It's a shame that Harbor City was never completed, as it could have been one of the very best TM titles if it was released. While at the same time, callously trash on the on-foot mode due to how bad it plays. There are elements that was carried over to the 2012 reboot, like the energy attacks now mapped to a single press on a d-pad, there's an amusement park, a stadium, and a map called Watkins Harbor. Yeah, I barely played the reboot, but I think my PC will melt if I play this on the PS3 emulator for more than an hour. Believe it or not, Twisted Metal is still alive, thanks to the TV show, which is surprisingly good, to the point Season 2 is in the works. Bit of a shocker, I know. I mean, I had a comment related to 2008's Death Race, but threw it out due to the show didn't suck. Even though the series still hasn't seen a new game for the past 12 years, 
the spirit of Twisted Metal lives on. Earlier in the video, I showed you a clip from a game I represent Twisted Metal Wasteland, and it's called Fumes. This is the demo version, but the full game will be even more wild from what I saw. There's also Crom's Car Combat, which got Twisted Metal's gameplay down to a T, even though it's very early in development. There's another one called Wreckage, and that one's practically a homage to Twisted 2, down to the UI and gameplay, which I heard it'll get a release late this year. Now there is one I'm interested in, is New Blood's take on a Twisted Metal-like title for PC. Unfortunately, news about this has been very quiet to the point we don't know no name for this. I mean, it's been two years since the last related post, and I have to take Big John Dave Oshry's word on, oh yeah, they're working on it. Slowly. Anyways, uh, will we ever get a new Twisted Metal? Your guess is good as mine. But it's not enough to entice me to buy a PS5 though. A car combat title on PC? Well, yeah, there are plenty, but you gotta impress the hell out of me that isn't a reskin of Twisted Metal 2. And so that's the end of the special in Season 2 of Lost Legends? Well, it's on the way, and it's gonna be a doozy. I hope you enjoyed this video. Leave a like, comment, hit subscribe, and share this video far and wide like breeding rabbits. Also, if you're watching this on Mates 2.0, then I highly recommend subscribing to my other channel, Type Rabbit, where I usually post my Lost Legends content and some other beta and cancel gameplay exclusively. If you want to stick with Mates 2.0, then I should recommend my Cyberpunk 2077 video where I play through the entire thing as a cyber samurai. Anyways, I think we're done here, and I'll see you later. Bye.